name's Leonie Bradbury. I'm the curator in residence here at Emerson, and I'm also the foster chair of contemporary art theory and practice. Uh, we are sitting inside the exhibition, Future Ancestral Technologies, Nakshibi, featuring the work of Chinupa Hanska Luker. Um, tonight's event, Future Traditions, Theorizing the Native Avant-Garde, will feature Dr. Adam Spry, who's an Emerson faculty. Before we get started, I just wanted to explain for full disclosure that we will be um, live streaming this talk. You people in the audience will not be on camera, but if you do ask a question, um, that question would be recorded. And the um, organization that's here live streaming with us today is called HowlRound. And HowlRound TV is a free and shared um, resource for live conversations and performances relevant to the world's performing arts and cultural fields. Its mission is to break geographic isolation, promote resource sharing, and to develop our knowledge commons collectively. So they had approached us if they could um, have permission to film this event today, and I think it's an incredible initiative, and we're happy to participate in it. So I will now introduce Dr. Adam Spry, <laughs> White Earth Anishinaabe, uh, teaches Native American, Global, Indigenous, and American literatures here at Emerson. His research examines the intersection of Native cultural production and U.S. federal Indian policy over the past two centuries. His monograph, Our War Paint is Writer's Inc. of 2018, is a comparative literary history of writing by and about the Anishinaabe people since the 19th century. Spry asks, what does it mean for Native writers and artists to embrace the avant-garde along with its deep mistrust of the traditional? In his talk this evening, Dr. Spry will discuss the history of the rise of Native American experimental art and literature in the 20th and 21st centuries, and its surprising roots in the U.S. efforts to promote the idea of Native artistic tradition, in quotes. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Adam Spry. Ani Baju, Adam Spry, the Dijdikas, Gawaba Baganikagi in Dunjiba, Kiksari in Dodem. My name's Adam Spry, I come from the White Earth Anishinaabe Nation in Minnesota. Um, uh, and uh, my my clan identity is as Kiksadi of the Sun House at Shakhan in Wrangell, Alaska. Those are my my in-laws people who took me in and gave me a name. Um, I tell you that I always start by saying that to tell you who I am, where I'm from, and most importantly to whom I have obligations. Um, that's always important for us to do. Uh, another thing I'd like to do before I begin is just to recognize that we are on the land of the Massachusetts people, uh, along with their Wampanoag and Nipmunk relatives, and that our occupation of this space right now is predicated on acts of violence that have happened historically and continue today. Um, so I've gotten that out of the way. Um, I want to just kind of informally and um, hopefully in a sort of fun and engaging way talk to you about the history of how we go from traditional Native American art to the avant-garde. Not that these two things are separate or not happening at the same time, they absolutely are, but asking the question, how do we go from Native American art as an intensely social praxis to a form of expression that is mediated by all sorts of imbrications in capitalism, right? So, um, to begin, I'm gonna start with a sort of personal overture, which is my engagement with this diptych um, called Lifestyles from 2007. I'm not gonna tell you the artist because the artist himself is not a good person um, and does not deserve a lot of recognition. Um, you can look it up if you want. But um, my, my engagement with this work um, stems from an uh, exhibition of Anishinaabe art in New York in 2014 um, at the National Museum of the American Indian. And I caught myself staring at these, this diptych and coming to a sort of profound and profoundly sad realization that the obviously ironic depiction of middle class native life in these two photographs was a pretty accurate depiction of what my own house looked like. <laughs> and it set me on a sort of both an existential crisis, but also um, a, a, a line of inquiry into Native American contemporary art, culture, and practice. Um, so some of the questions I had is, how did we get to a place where not only can we imagine a middle-class Native couple, 
like myself and my partner, um, being skewered as sort of the subjects of an IKEA catalog, right? Um, what were the economic and historical forces at work that led to not just this being a possibility, but also this becoming itself a piece of art to be consumed? And the answer to that question is what I'm going to be talking with you about tonight. And to understand it, we have to go back. And by back, I mean all the way back. Unfortunately, back to the beginning. One of the first things, and um, if this seems redundant or um, unnecessary, I apologize, but I actually think oftentimes it is important to say, Native Americans have existed on this continent and been making art since time immemorial. Right? So I know it's sort of hard to see, but these are Anishinaabe pictographs from the Great Lakes. Um, uh, Native American art in various forms and various material practices has been around forever, right? for as long as people have occupied this continent. Um, that being said, Native American art historically was not, uh, did not operate in sort of what we would think of as modes of art that are more familiar with us today. They're like, uh, by which I mean sort of commodity, as commodities. Um, Instead, Native American art existed in a complex relation of social praxis, right? ceremonial, um, intercommunal, etc. Um, in the 19th century, um, after colonization, I know I'm jumping quite far ahead from time immemorial to the 19th century, but bear <laughs> with me. Um, in the 19th century, uh, the idea of collecting Native American art really started to take off. Um, there had been some people who'd collected what before then would be thought of as artifacts, but really thinking about Native Americans as producers of art qua art is sort of a 19th century phenomenon. Um, part of this ha comes into being because of the mass dispossession of Native American cultural artifacts throughout the 19th century by anthropologists, but also in the case of this slide here, as part of the settler state, in this case the settler state of Canada's efforts to break down tribal practices societies and religions. So these are pieces of art that ended up in Western Museum collections that were confiscated from the Kwakwakwak people um, in the 19th century after their traditional potlatch, which is a ceremonial giveaway, was made illegal for its communistic, anti-capitalist sort of uh, implication in the 19th century. They would take away the material that the Native people used to promote their own social praxis, but then would sell it, the objects they confiscated as art pieces, right? So we see some of that at work. Um, the situation, the, the, the specific idea that I'm trying to trace, however, is really a 20th century idea, and to understand it, we have to go to now next, New Mexico. So, um, early 20th century New Mexico is a very fascinating place for anybody who's familiar with it. Um, it uh, in the early 20th century in New Mexico, you have this weird confluence of high modernist, Euro-American high modernist practitioners and native people existing simultaneously in the same place at the same time. So here we see Awasira's mountain sheep dance. Uh, Awasira is part of the San Indivalenzo self-taught school, a group of Pueblo artists who were mentored by the wife of a superintendent of a uh, superintendent of the Indian School of Santa Fe. Um, she promoted Pueblo painting, Pueblo style painting, but also in its traditional sense, but also sort of updated for modern sensibilities, right? Um, so in this piece, we can see uh, echoes of a traditional style, but also in its flatness and its use of negative space, a very sort of modernist sensibility beginning to emerge, right? Um, at this time, there is a growing uh, attention to primitivism in both the, the visual arts and also the written literary arts, right? Um, this, this engagement with primitivism is less of a celebration of indigenous cultures and indigenous identities and more, as T.S. Eliot will put it, a way of engaging with useful raw material um, for the artist to engage with and refine. So as Eliot says, but as he, meaning the artist, um, is the first person to see the merits of the savage, the barbarian, and the rustic, he is also the first person to see how the savage, the barbarian, and the rustic can be improved upon. 
So this rhetoric of improvement is not just an aesthetic sort of sensibility, but also literally written into US federal policy at the time. Um, in the late 19th, early 20th century, we have uh, institutions like Native American boarding schools, um, efforts to reform tribal nations into sort of uh, acquisitive capitalist polities, a whole bunch of things going on that, that follow the same logic that Eliot's promoting here. Native culture, native people are there to be improved upon by their betters. Right? Um, and this is exactly what begins to happen, especially in Santa Fe during this time. So we have artists like George O'Keefe or D.H. Lawrence or oh, any number that we could talk about, Mabel Dodge Lewin, Alice Corbin Henderson, a bunch of people passing through Santa Fe at this time who are self-consciously engaging with tribal themes, tribal histories, tribal cultures in their own artistic practice. And, and part of this is the sort of second wave of American modernist cultural production um, that tends to get lumped in with an American avant-garde, at least in the Euro-American sensibility. So the, uh, the association with Native Americans with the avant-garde has a long history in the United States. Um, but for my purposes, what I really want to trace is how that relationship was exploited and intensified by the US government. So um, under the direction, in part, of several of the artists and writers who are in Santa Fe at this time, you have the promotion of legislation called the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1935, which sought to um, promote the economic welfare of Indian tribes and the Indian wards of the government through the development of Indian arts and crafts and the expansion of the market for the products of Indian arts and craftsmanship. The Indian Arts and Crafts Board um, had several purposes uh, uh, that went beyond this. They also policed the identity of people who were producing quote unquote Native American art. Um, and they, uh, I should say, that this board that was instituted was all non-native, um, a strange sort of interesting uh, historical interlude is that Vincent Price is one of the first members, that Vincent Price, right, is one of the first members of the board and actually chairs the board later on in the 60s. Um, actually, um, well, get into that. Um, but the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, uh, makes formal this recognition that art can be an avenue towards economic development and the increasing sort of capitalization, capitalist exploitation, however you want to say it, of Native people. Um, oh, I should also mention one of the big promoters of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act is Rene de Harnicourt, who was one of uh, Nelson Rockefeller's personal art collectors and um, also one of the leading luminaries of an institution we call the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So under the direction of René de Harnicourt, there is a landmark exhibition that's put together by the Indian Arts and Crafts Board of Native American Art, specifically at the Museum of Modern Art. Right? So most of the material that was depicted in this exhibition is traditional art or traditional at the time. Right? We're not talking about contemporary or experimental native art, but rather the traditional arts being presented as modern. Right? And this has, and I, um, Joy, I'm following Joy Gritton's fabulous book on this here. Um, this has a couple of different reasons, um, none of which have to do with native people themselves, or if so, only incidentally. Um, first and foremost, there is a desperate need in American modern art at this time to separate itself from Europe. Either the sort of fascistic modernism that, that comes about in Germany or the sort of communistic lineage of modernism that's coming out of Russia at the time. By presenting uh, Native American art in this new, and, and MoMA was pretty new at the time, uh, context, uh, it provided American modern art an indigenous lineage to fall back on that was not just non-European, but in some ways anti-European. Right? Um, the, uh, the exhibition did not actually do a great job of uh, drawing attention to Native artists specifically, but rather Native traditions generally, and was very explicit about its commodification of those cultural practices. So in the attending catalog, we can see this, um, 
Many contemporary travel products can be used without adaptation in modern homes and as part of modern dress. Some of these may find a place in our houses and wardrobes simply because of their decorative value, but many combine utility with aesthetic merit. Right? So already we see some um, very interesting conflation of sort of aesthetic value with use value. Um, again, with no, <laughs> no attention paid to the production of this art, uh, I find it very hilarious here that um, the tribal identification of this piece is identified um, and its location is identified. It makes no mention of the artist, but it makes sure to say that whoever lent it, who owned it originally, did so anonymously. Right? So there's some levels of irony there. All right, um, the, uh, uh, the show at MoMA was a, a big success, and René de Harnoncourt was also interested, uh, along with the U.S. government, I should say, um, in, in the promotion of Native art. Um, now, arts education had been done in the United States at boarding schools since at least the 19th century. Um, there's a great book on this. I can't remember the author, but the title is called Colonized by Art, um, or Colonized Through Art which is about the history of arts education in boarding schools. Um, most of that arts education had been directed at um, bringing Native students into a sort of Western artist, artistic tradition of mimetic representation. However, uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board had a different idea. They wanted to create a space where tribal artists could pursue their own traditional artistic practice, refined and improved, a la T.S. Eliot, by instruction in Western artistic traditions. So with that in mind, in 1962, uh, there was established on the campus of the Santa Fe Indian School, the Institute for American Indian Arts. Um, IIA started off as a post-high school program, non-degree granting, um, where native, young Native artists who were, who were identified early on, usually in a boarding school or otherwise government-run school context, as having artistic talent, or talent were sent to develop that talent. While at IAI, those first generations of students were pushed gently towards adapting sort of the aesthetic tenets of modernism. Not only that, but their time was split between artistic education, art historical education, but also um, things like how to make small pop talk at dinner parties, right? So the, the education was, was simultaneously artistic and practice oriented, but also directed at making them sort of properly middle-class subjects of the art market, right? And that was intentional and very specifically done. Um, the early documents around IAIA suggest that one of the goals that the federal government had in promoting it was to detribalize Native artists and detribalize Native art by taking these people out of their communal contexts, turning them into middle-class artists who could then circulate in places like New York City, Chicago, Paris, etc. Um, so we can see a pretty direct through line from Native, school, Native American boarding schools and their assimilation project and the sort of arts education happening at IAI. Um, one, of the first, uh, one of the first instructors at IAI is a Lusuenio artist named Fritz Scholder. I'm sorry for the quality of this picture and its watermark. Um, but Fritz Scholder uh, was uh, very interesting figure in the development of IAI. He really pushed students not to do any sort of experimentation in their own practice while simultaneously carving out a space for himself as a very experimental Native American painter of, of various kinds of subject matter. Um, Fritz Scholder uh, leaves IAI in the 70s, but um, also sort of leaves his mark, as it were, in terms of creating pieces like this that developed him a great deal of attention in the art market. So this is Indian with a beer can from 1969. Um, I see Shoulder not as a sort of genesis point, but as one of the early um, manifestations of what I'm identifying as a native avant-garde. And I mean that very specifically as a, not just natives doing the avant-garde later, but what does the avant-garde mean to native people? So here with Shoulder's piece, we can see it's uh, sort of challenging of authenticity by having an Indian with no real visual signifiers of Indianness besides his skin color and potentially his bracelet um, set in a context, ostensibly, or in, one could imagine at a bar with a can of beer, which itself is a sort of very 
aggressive commentary on Native American identity in 1969, right? So one of the early, or one of the things that I identify in the Native avant-garde is this push-pull of authenticity and representation, challenging stereotypes while also promoting some stereotypes and not allowing the viewer to sort of settle in to their understanding of Indianness and its interaction with the art, which is very different than, say, what was happening at MoMA in 1942, where people are just kind of engaging with what they think is traditional in the bar. All right, so uh, as IAI is getting off the ground, we have this sort of second wave of modernism or postmodernism happening, and uh, we have another wave of primitivism, um, this time from uh, people who are doing uh, performance art, such as E.S. Boyce, his piece from 1974, I Like America and America Likes Me, which was presented as an apology to both the landscape and peoples of North America for the actions of Europeans. Uh, by way of this apology, he locked himself in a room with a coyote for seven days. Um, as far as I understand it, Native people were neither consulted nor involved in the production of this piece. I still think it's really interesting, but um, just to get us to think about Boyce's idea that he can speak on behalf of Europeans, but also towards indigenous people without them being present is something interesting. But for the first time, arguably for the first time, because of the success of institutions like IAIA and also greater access to higher education, arts education by Indian artists in the mid 19th century, we also have another listening to artists, uh, artists like James Luna, who are taking these practices, these sort of avant-garde performance art practices and using them to critique the way in which Native people's bodies and artistic objects had been presented um, in, in Euro-American history. So in this piece, uh, James Luna actually uh, put himself on display, laid in a museum case, I think for an entire day, as, as, a, as a commentary on the commodification, not just of Native art, but in, in museum settings, but also Native bodies, which is a whole other thing that uh, the United States still to this day has tens of thousands of indigenous human remains, um, sometimes even on display, still. All right, um, the last uh, sort of policy shift that I want to draw our attention to, and for, for me one of the most interesting, is an update to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1935 that happens in 1990. This strengthens the ability of the AICB to um, police authenticity in Native art. So what I've uh, exerted here is uh, part of the strengthening. It is um, unlawful to offer or display for sale or sell any good with or without a government trademark in a manner that falsely suggests it is Indian produced, an Indian product, or the product of a particular Indian or Indian tribe or Indian arts and crafts organization resident within the US. As far as I know, this is the only piece of government legislation that allows the government to authenticate art produced by people of certain races as being produced by those races. Now, the irony of this being that uh, it is, it falls within the purview of the federal government, the same, oh, excuse me, the same federal government that has been doing its best to detribalize, dispossess, and assimilate Native people, is now defining Native identity for the purposes of the art market. Right? All right, um, so that leads me more or less to the present day, and I uh, wanted to show you some more examples of what I'm identifying as the native avant-garde and talk a little bit about what that means, or what I think it might mean. So we'll move to the contemporary visual arts. First, I want to talk about this piece by Brian Youngin. Youngin, I, can, I never know how to pronounce his name. Uh, Prototypes for a New Understanding. This is his series of sculptures and installations produced between 1998 and 2005. As you can see, they have obvious similarities, oh, visual similarities with Northwest Coast art. Brian Young himself is from a Northwest Coast tribe. Um, they look like uh, the traditional, what we call form line sort of art that is common in the Pacific Northwest. And yet, um, in terms of their production, they are produced using, as you can probably tell already, Air Jordan sneakers. Right? Disassembled and then reassembled to look like traditional forms of art, though um, there's some, they're not engaged with directly sort of traditional designs. They're more imaginative redesigns. 
Uh, at the same time, there are included in these pieces uh, signifiers of authenticity, like the hair, which is a is common feature of Northwest Coast art. Um, traditionally, you would take hair from people that you had captured in battle, not, not the scalp, but just the hair, and incorporate it into the art to sort of sanctify it or make it a ceremonial object. Um, Youngin's commentary on the way in which Native art operates in the same sort of um, circulation, mode of circulation as the Air Jordan, uh, can't help but draw attention to uh, sort of Marx's construction of the commodity fetish. And I think this is very important for understanding Native American, the Native American avant-garde. Um, this is as close as I am to having a thesis statement. Um, this is a, a work in progress um, <laughs> that I'm developing. But essentially, uh, my thesis about the Native American avant-garde is it's an extended, and this doesn't apply to all Native American contemporary art, but rather a very specific subset, uh, Native American art that is involved in an extended sort of commentary or meditation on the commodity fetish as applied to Native cultural production. Right? So Marx's idea of the commodity fetish being that it, it, it's what allows us to blind ourselves to the social relations that produce an object. Um, uh, in this case, the uncomfortable association being made is between the sweatshop labor that produces the sneakers and the slave hair, that's the term for it, the slave hair that's also in integrated into the piece. Drawing that uncomfortable connection with traditional Northwest Coast practices, uh, historical practices, cultural practices, and commodity fetishism, but never really resolving that contradiction. All right, let's move on to the piece. The, this Native American avant-garde that I'm trying to identify is specifically, um, and I think self-consciously, responding back to prior articulations of the avant-garde in the Western canon, Western artistic tradition, in that it has a sort of uncomfortable association with kitsch, and it's playing with those registers of low and high culture, working class and bourgeois culture. Um, uh, this is a, a sort of secondary feature of this art, um, is that it really is thinking through class in a way that I think is unresolved, but very interesting, which is to say the increasing distinction of Native Americans, Native American communities as being, having class, right? So if we think back to the arts education happening in IAIA and the attempt to make sort of proper bourgeois middle-class Indian artists, well, the product of that class division, class distinction, is the emergence of a native middle class. And it's not just art that's doing this, there's a lot of policy changes happening at the same time, where we're starting to see, increasingly, a divide between lower and upper class native people, the haves and have-nots, in a way that isn't really properly understood or theorized even in academic, academic discourse. So Wendy Redstar's piece here is obviously a commentary on the Thanksgiving, but also uh, uh, the Thanksgiving tableau, but also the, uh, the Last Supper, hence the name, The Last Thanks. But also what's important about it to my mind is its presentation of highly refined foods uh, of the kind that you would see um, uh, Native people, especially in, in remote reservations out west, relying on these highly processed food products that, that um, become sort of the basis of modern subsistence in, in reservation communities, uh, especially the more remote ones. All right, um, moving on. Another aspect of this, and, and maybe even a subcategory of this, is uh, the emergence, or I should say increasing popularity of native pop art, right? Stephen Paul Judd, um, I'm also thinking of um, uh, Echo Hawk, Echo Hawk. One of the Echo Hawks, Bunky, Bunky Echo Hawk, um, Bunky Echo Hawk and others. Um, and this is, this is really an artistic practice that I've, I'm really split on. Um, what we're seeing in this, this new emergence of native pop art, which is really popular in native communities, and perhaps the least sort of academic of these artists that I'm talking about, is simply taking objects of sort of commodification from normative Euro-American cultural discourse and bringing them into a native context without much commentary. 
So we see a lot of this, like the form line adaptations of like Batman or Superman, I can't remember the artist who does that, or Bunky Echo Hawk's own practice of sort of painting Yoda in a headdress and sort of traditional Pawnee regalia. Um, this, I think, is a commentary on commodity and commodification, but I also think it is, uh, well, I might have to have a conversation with you all to try to figure this one out a little bit more. Right? <laughs> but let's just uh, uh, say that this is part of the, the archival material that I'm thinking through. Lastly, I'm gonna show you a piece that I encountered just this last weekend in, in Toronto at the Biennial. Um, up there. Um, these are two pieces by Dana Claxton. Um, now, in the artist statement that I read, um, the, the artist presented these as celebrations of Native women's um, uh, fashion and cultural identity, but what struck me in looking at them is the way in which identity is actually obscured through a sort of spectacular overindulgence in material objects and uh, sort of the spectacle of of these objects, divorced from any sort of cultural context, presented on a body in a black background, in a way that can't help but draw attention to their materiality, but also their existence as commodity, right? Um, uh, and uh, these pieces are, are uh, especially this piece, uh, what they make me think about in thinking through commodity and its relationship to native art is not just the way in which commodification obscures the social relations of production. And here I'm thinking of Peter Berger's theory of the avant-garde, right? That the avant-garde is an attempt to reinsert artistic practice into um, social life, right? Capitalism comes in, divorces art from religion or society, and turns it into a commodity, and the avant-garde reacts against that. Um, but I'm also thinking through uh, the way in which native cultural production is, uh, creates surplus value through its identification as indigenous art, by which I mean, um, one thing that I think is true of a lot of the artists under consideration is that all of them are attempting or have attempted in one way or another to distance themselves from the, um, or I, I should say these artists specifically, but you see a lot of this, of the native artists trying to say, I don't want to be understood as just an indigenous artist, right? Trying to articulate their artistic practice on a sort of equal playing ground with other contemporary artists. At the same time, there is a sort of market force that wishes to always identify them as indigenous, even as they resist it. And part of what I'm thinking through with this is the way in which that identification of an indigenous artist, and more specifically their art as quote-unquote native art, is a kind of surplus value, right? Where the surplus value is not the alienated labor of the artist, but rather the alienation of the collective labor of the artist's community, ancestors, and traditions that is used to, um, for sort of, capitalist profit-seeking, not necessarily by the artist, but by the uh, infrastructure of arts education, promotion, and uh, display that we have working today. So my, my own work on this is focused primarily not on the visual arts, but on the literary arts, where we see um, a similar attention to uh, uh, questions of materiality, the objectness of text, um, its circulation and its uh, um, sort of removal from cultural context. So this is DJ Nana Cockpicks Under Erasure from her collection Corpse, Corpse Whale from 2012. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much, but essentially I, I see what's going on in the Native contemporary arts, at least some of the artists that I'm talking about happening also in, in Native American, especially poetry, contemporary avant-garde poetry. Uh, which is a return to avant-garde techniques from mid-century to both comment on and uh, uh, sort of the commodification of native arts, but also, and this is where it gets really interesting, D.J. Nanak Uppick herself is a graduate of Institute of American Indian Arts, where she was instructed specifically in, by Arthur Z 
who taught poetry there for a long time, in sort of traditions of the avant-garde, misty poets, language poets, the New York School, et cetera, et cetera. And so one thing that I think is really important to think about is the way in which this avant-garde is not just a sort of natural, organic response to capitalism, but it is in, itself, in it of itself a government-mandated aesthetic being promoted in schools run by the United States government. Right? And thinking about the sort of circularity or insularity of, of these avant-garde works as being kind of the point. Their rejections of authenticity, their idea that culture can be divorced from context or their mourning of that all serves a greater purpose of breaking down tribal polities and turning native artists rather than participants in their communities into sort of transparent, um, uh, well, not even transparent, autonomous bourgeois subjects, right? And that's, that's, so we have to keep that in mind, that this isn't just an organic avant-garde, but rather really promoted in US policy since at least the 1930s. Right? So uh, with that in mind, let's talk about politics. Um, where do I see this coming from? I've given you some of the historical antecedents. I also want to just draw some of the political implications of this a little bit. Um, first, I think obviously, most obviously, this art is in deep conversation with uh, questions that have been around for a long time of native appropriation, appropriation of native cultural materials. So you've probably heard about this uh, uh, urban output is getting sued in 2011 for its use of the term Navajo, which actually um, was brought to court under the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Uh, they were sued for saying that this was Navajo when it wasn't produced by Navajo people. The Navajo Nation took them to court and lost. And it was determined that the, by, by the courts that the Navajo Nation hadn't defended its trademark on the term Navajo since it had been used in, in a commercial sense for most of the 19th and 20th century. And therefore they did not have a claim to it. Okay? Um, so obviously Urban Outfitters is easy to dislike, but let's talk about something that for a lot of Native people is more close to home. Pendleton, non-Native owned company that has for the better part of the last century um, both been an important source of sort of materials for giveaways, potlatches, and other cultural events in Native, in native communities. Um, I got a potlatch blanket for graduating from high school. I got a pot, or not potlatch, a Pendleton blanket for graduating high school. I got a, pot, a Pendleton blanket for getting married. I've given away Pendleton blankets. I can't tell you how many times, right? And yet, Pendleton itself, um, even though it's, it, its market towards native people is actually fairly minimal, um, most of its market is in selling the idea of Indianness and Indian cultural identity that it has developed through its long economic relationship with Native people to non-Natives and in sometimes very uncomfortable ways. So here we see the uh, Mickey Mouse collection spot towel that takes a, a popular uh, Native themed jacquard from Pendleton's collection and just simply adds Mickey Mouse to it. There's other more egregious things that Pendleton does like selling hand-stitched pictures of like pugs wearing headdresses and all sorts of stuff right, that we can talk about. Um, and yet, and yet, and yet, um, I as a middle-class native person not only have all these Pendleton blankets, but you'll often see me walking around with like a, a Pendleton sort of swag bag and a uh, Pendleton hat and that sort of thing too, as a signifier of the nativeness and also my class status. Um, and it's not just non-natives uh, doing um, some of the things that I think this artist is responding to, it's also native people. So Louis Gong, uh, in the last 10 years, has tried to develop an alternative to Pendleton in a company called Eighth Generation, in which he's per, uh, selling wool blankets that were designed by native people, not all Pendleton blankets, actually a very small minority of Pendleton blankets are designed by native people. Um, at Louis Gong's shop, um, the blankets are designed by native people um, and sold in a native-owned store but produced in China, um, which is a point of contestation in and outside of Native communities. Um, so, um, and, and lastly, as a, a sort of a point of um, meditation, and I, I'm not trying to call anyone out here, but I just want to think about sort of the pr promotion of Native art in this commodity, um, in, in, in the form of commodity by thinking about this piece specifically, a luxury medicine pouch produced by Anishinaabe artist Louise Solomon, 
Um, the, it, I want to read that as a very ironic thing, a medicine pouch, a sign of, of uh, Anishinaabe, a sort of um, spiritual practice in which one submits themselves to cosmological power through an act of pity being redeployed as a luxury object, right? And just thinking through that. Um, I know that's, I'm not offering you a lot of uh, conclusions about that, but it's something I'm thinking through. I also wanted to just draw your attention to something that showed up in the New York Times just in the last, um, last weekend. Um, this is a story about uh, the establishment by the Canadian government, or in collaboration with the Canadian government, with the Dorset Cape Eskimo Arts Collective. And I'm not a cultural insider here, and I would like to hear from community members about this. The article was written by a non-community member. But the picture it painted was actually pretty grim uh, in the sense that this arts co-op, which was established in the 1970s to promote Inuit arts, right, um, around which a community had built up houses and all that sort of stuff, um, ended up uh, creating a sort of vicious cycle of dependency where Inuit, art, Inuit artists would relocate to this community in order to make art, in order to afford the means to go do their subsistence practices. It follows the story of one Inuit artist who's trying to buy a snowmobile through, through selling art, and she increasingly has to make more and more art and spend more and more time making more and more art to, in order to afford the snow machine that will allow her to travel the distance necessary to do her traditional subsistence hunting and gathering. Right. And to my mind, that really strikes me as echoing back to the old factory system of the fur trade in the, 19, or in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Um, though, like I said, I'd like to um, get more information about that from community insiders. Uh, politically, I think, I think it should be clear at this point that my interest in this has to do with my interest in capitalism as it has been applied unevenly and violently onto Native communities. And um, one way of thinking about this is through Glenn Coulthard, uh, the uh, political theorists thinking in red skin, white masks, that the state insists that the accommodation of indigenous cultural difference, so in this case art, uh, be reconcilable with one political formation, namely colonial sovereignty, meaning the sovereignty not of indigenous people, but of the settler state, and one mode of production, namely capitalism. Right? Um, I, think, I think in a final sort of analysis, this is art that is trying very hard and very desperately to comment on the role capitalism has played in native communities, yet is dependent for its promotion and circulation on those same sort of capitalist markets and elite spaces. Now, this isn't a new thing. Other avant-garde movements have been stuck in this sort of double bind. I mean, that is the history of the avant-garde as a practice. But it's worth thinking about in terms of native communities because, because there are still alternatives within and among those communities of non-exploitative, non-capitalist practice. Now, um, the thing about those is I don't have slides of them because we don't have access to them. And part of the reason they still exist is simply and precisely because we don't have access to them, right? And so it's worth our consideration that um, if we do have an investment in Native societies and the coherence of Native cultural traditions, especially their non or anti-capitalist cultural traditions, it may mean losing access to Native cultural production itself. Um, one commentary on this, and then I'll open up for questions, that I think is really interesting and a very rich sort of meditation on this dynamic, is Nick Bolanon, Clinket Artist's uh, Unceremonial da Dance Mask from 2017. I'm simply going to show the video without commentary, and then after the video is over, um, I'd be happy to answer questions. So let me boot up the video for you. 
have no idea why the munchkins is what the algorithm thinks that we want to see. <laughs> Such as it is. And this is from Galanin's artist statement about this piece. The unceremonial dance mask reflects the resilience of culture and community, not form. The destruction of mimicry remains evident. As the mask is danced in the firelight, it remains unceremonial. The dance can be performed without the mask. Which, I would, I, in my mind, I always read the little addendum, but not without a community. So I, I open it up for uh, any questions you might have. I, and, and I mean that any questions. I know I kind of dumped a lot on you, especially without a lot of context. I know uh, opportunities to learn about indigenous history are few and far between, so I invite all questions and all comers. Why do you use the term avant-garde? Um, it's a self-conscious thing on my part, um, in part because I, I, want, I want to draw attention to how wrong it is to use. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the avant-garde is a, you know, early 20th century practice done by dead white guys in Paris, right? Like, yeah. and, um, but in my mind, I, I think, and I think these artists, though they may be hesitant to say so themselves, but I think in their, in this aesthetic of mixture of kitsch and tradition in commentaries on commodity and art, right, are really going back to that historical avant-garde moment in the early 20th century, but not organically, not, you know, out of a sense of aesthetic development that they're late getting there, but because they're being taught it in school as what other people did when they were confronted with questions of authenticity, community, society, and, um, and commodification, right? And so, um, I, especially with the poetry, I mean, it doesn't come through in the art, maybe perhaps as much, but in the poetry, there is this, this constant sense, especially when you see Native people like engaging with forms like language poetry, for example, which is an avant-garde poetic practice that kind of had it heyday in the 70s. Um, mostly, almost actually entirely white and mostly male, like poetic practice, right? Um, and I think what we see embedded in the art, I could have spoken to this more, is this commentary that the avant-garde qua avant-garde as this effort to kind of break from cycles of identity and tradition is actually really embedded in whiteness in ways that Native people can't get away from. So it's not the avant-garde, it has to be the Native avant-garde, right, in that full formal construction where that Native is doing that sort of value-added thing that I was talking about before. But I, I like the contradiction that it presents, that, that we have Native people who are always seen as in deep dialogue with tradition in a sense of historicity, um, taking up practices that were developed by people who wanted to make radical breaks with history and tradition. And I think these artists are, but also not, right? Um, I could vacillate on that for like another hour or two. <laughs> Recently, this last week, saw the uh, saw the phrase "indigenous futurism" as an idea, and I was wondering if you had heard about that, heard yeah. that phrase, and how that's being used uh, in, uh, within the, within the art, art context or yeah. in relation to avant garde. I mean, we're in it. I mean, Chinuba Show is all about the indigenous future, indigenous futurism. Um, Futurism as a as a concept. I mean, I mean, you have to think of through futurism's historical valence as an avant-garde movement that was closely aligned with fascism, in its desire for return and vitality and sort of cultural authenticity. And so, um, I don't know. I don't think indigenous people are, are sort of thinking through those valences of futurism. I think I think they're more playing off of the paradox of imagining a future for native people, right? But that being said, there are all of these associations that come along with it that are embedded in the use of the term and its history of mobilization, right? Um, that are worth thinking through. I don't, I don't think it's as easy as saying we can, 
simply claim indigenous futurism without understanding that <laughs> there's a whole weighted history there, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't you think when, and again, I'm, I'm naive to this artist here sure. or, or any of this, but um, I feel like it's being used in, in more in relation to like Afrofuturism, right? I mean, I think that's more of a, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, more I, I, of a touch point. Yeah, I, and I think so, and I think, I think, um, be careful with how I, I say this, right? I, I think there is a, a way in which that um, there have been indigenous speculation for a long time, right? Um, you know, uh, I'm thinking 1970s, there's a book by Martin Cruz Smith, who most of you might know more from his like Gorky Park novels and that sort of thing called War Spy Thrillers. But he's actually quite low. His first novel is called The Indians One, and it's a counterfactual history of like Native American military leaders getting together in 1876, and you have like Stan Wati and you have Geronimo and Crazy Horse all in a TV together planning to overthrow the US government. Right? Like that is what we think of as as sort of today as indigenous futurism, but it's it, it wasn't identified as such, right? Um, I think, I think thinking about the use of the term futurism is worth thinking about all the context it shows up, given its cultural heritage or its history. Um, though I'm not as conversant with the Afrofuturist sort of, I'm sure that's a conversation that's already happening in that, in that discourse. Field. Indigenous futurism, for me, you know, as as a practice, as Chinook is practicing it, I think is is a, a it is. It's an attempt to imagine artistically and outside to the double line that I'm talking about here, that native culture is always being intervened upon by capitalism, right? And so various forms of indigenous futurity that we see emerge recently, including Chinupa's work here, is trying to imagine a sort of apocalyptic break with the past. So again, it's sort of avant-garde, but more terribly avant-garde sort of the apocalypse comes and we can go back to our traditions, they have to change, but we can go back to them. That I think is useful in some contexts and not as useful in others and it just sort of depends on how it's mobilized, right? So, um, I think there's some amount of indigenous futurism that's very much sort of driven by a sort of anti-colonial fantasy that may not be politically useful. And then there's some indigenous futurisms that are very politically engaged in thinking through like the nuts and bolts and materiality of what does it mean for indigenous peoples to have a future and what will the necessary preconditions be for, for the kind of futures that indigenous peoples want to have, right? Does that make sense? Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the problems that I was running into as an English professor is that like we have, we run into terms as people use them, and my definition of indigenous futurism might not be what everybody else thinks it is. So, <laughs> if that makes sense. Well, chima quit, you guys. Thank you very much for coming out. I appreciate it. Hope it was interesting. <laughs>